The better than the ring. Awesome. No, I'm sorry. No, no, no worries. Uh, so our next talk is by Professor Schultes. He's a professor of neurosurgery and neurosciences at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Uh, he received his doctorate in Budapest and conducted doctoral research at Oxford, Stanford, and Dallas. And specifically in space, he's done research on how galactic cosmic radiation uh, as in prolonged space flight uh, exposure causes multifaceted neurocognitive impairments. And that's sort of what this talk will be about. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Schultes. <laughs> Thank you very much for, uh, first of all, for organizing this. I, I was just too busy, but I wanted to do something like this for like a decade. And so it's great. It's really good. Um, and I hope you guys will continue. And I'm always happy to come and listen. So thank you. Uh, so I, what I'm going to talk to you about, I know it's late. I'll keep it light. Uh, but I will show you some data points just so that you can see what we're talking about. So basically, like many times in life, you get into things because just completely by chance. So I was always interested, of course, like many of us were when we were kids, right, in space travel. I, I grew up in Hungary and uh, was a strong theoretical biology group there just because it was cheap, right? <laughs> you didn't need anything. So um, just pen and paper. And, uh, and they were very interested in the origin of life and astrobiology, and they published in that domain and all that. Um, so anyway, and then I, you know, I became a professor at U uh, uh, University of California, Irvine. I was there for, for a while before moving up here. And basically a colleague of mine from radiology moved in there that NASA has this call for understanding space radiation effects on the brain. And I'm, you are a neuroscientist, me, me. So do you want to join forces? I was like, whatever, you know, so we wrote like a, he wrote most of it. I added this much and I got only little money. And it was like $10 million. I was like, whoa, well, yeah, I should have put in more. And then the next time it came around, I put in more. <laughs> so I learned my lesson. And anyway, so, uh, but, you know, it's it's an inspiring topic, right? We all love it. And uh, um, and I don't know whether how many of you read this Martian Chronicles. I kind of grew up on it. I, I love that book. Um, it's about how humans, you know, go to Mars and they, of course, give some disease to the Martians and they almost die out and stuff like this. But anyway, so, um, so, and then because of what I'm going to tell you about, we got to go to the, to this meeting in Galveston, you know, I think you were there too. Uh, some of you might have gone there. It's really kind of very inspiring. Like you get to see the original, um, you know, this is from the, you know, heroic times when you went to the moon and this was, for example, I don't know where I can read this, is broccoli au gratin. That's how it is, you know? So it's this high, high cuisine up there. So anyway, the uh, the people who actually did the work, actually some of them are here. So Peter Klein did most of it. Um, and uh, Gergu um, is also here and Thilo, and he's not here, but, and I'm not going to talk much about their stuff. Um, anyway, so, but thank you for, what you guys have been doing on this domain. It's kind of, it's not what we do in the lab as, as our major focus, but you know, kind of this is the fun stuff, right? So what is the question? So, so basically the question is that that, is, that has been suddenly NASA realized this uh, maybe 15 years ago that up to that point, they, they knew about space radiation, but what they were focusing on is cancer. And there was good reason for that because so these are the various ions, right? Proton, helium, lithium, and so on. And uh, this is uh, in a photo emulsion. You see these visible images and then these side radiations coming off the main track, right? This is the size of, of a typical mammalian cell, right? So you can imagine when this goes through a, a, neuro, uh, or a neuron or, or another cell, it can cause some damage. This is, for example, DNA breaks. Right. Um, so uh, it's clear that there is some radiation can be uh, pretty tricky. And I show you what is the combination of actually these, these ion radiations in space. Well, let's just say that NASA, first of all, was focusing on for a long time on kind of medical type radiations like X-rays, um, you know, photons and, uh, and uh, you know, and gamma rays. And less so these things, these actual little particles zipping through space, right? That's galactic radiation. These are the doses, and it doesn't matter what this means, but this is your dose 
um, annually. If you get an abdominal CT, this is logarithmic scale that goes up, let's say whatever, three times. Um, this is six months on, on the International Space Station. And then if you go to Mars, again, this is logarithmic. So a little bit, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of radiation here. You know, so you go from whatever this is, four uh, units to, you know, above 100. So it's, it's much more, it's, it's, a, it's considerable. So, and then, um, so the person who walked into my office, whatever, 13, 14 years ago, is the person who wrote this article, Char Charlie Limoli, uh, that could it be that the major deal breaker for any kind of human space flight to Mars is actually, is the galactic space radiation effects on the brain, right? So CNS, central nervous system effects. And this, this was kind of scary. And NASA then came up with the CNS grants. That's how we got the money. Uh, and you, you can read it for the service. Essentially, is asking, like, so what happens to cognitive performance, right? I mean, you know, it's important that the, an astronaut remembers to put on the spacesuit first before stepping outside. You know what I mean? And so, so orders uh, of things that you do, your memory, um, you know, your mood and all of those things that ultimately, of course, is coming from the brain. So the main question is, do space relevant doses and rates of irradiation cause long lasting changes in synaptic transmission and cognitive function? So, um, so a synapse, I hope everybody heard of it. It's like the connection between two cells, right? In your brain. Um, and there are, you know, billions of neurons in the brain and each, each neuron makes thousands of synaptic contacts with other neurons and they influence each other. That's a network, right? Um, and so this is the grant that we got, and it's important once you become a kind of a researcher, you understand that money is important for these kind of scientific adventures. Um, but anyway, so here is just a very short, um, just a little bit more detail. There's a lot that you can kind of, um, you know, how you can defend against these various types of radiations. You can see like, for example, all for radiations, even a, a paper can stop it, right? Uh, X-rays, you can stop it, for example, with lead. Neutron goes through lead too, so and so on, right? So, but the problem is that, of course, in a spacecraft, you can't shield it, like you can't put up like, you know, three feet of lead, right, around the spacecraft. So, and, and, the, and the galactic space radiations are coming from all directions. And uh, these are little bullets, and they highly energetic, and they are at relativistic speeds, and uh, these are heavy ions, many of them. So this is the distribution. So there's proton, helium. These are all just the actual nuclei. The, the electrons have been uh, stripped off. And, and you have all the rest of it, like oxygen, silicon, and iron are the most, most uh, frequent ones. And uh, just as a kind of rule of thumb, so one gray, gray is the unit, the, the um, uh, international unit of the um, of radiation, the, that's the absorbed radiation. Um, the details are not important, but the point is, as a rule of thumb, one gray of radiation would be survivable. Five, 10, you would die very soon. So, uh, so that's as a rule of thumb. And this is what you would accumulate um, in one day, and then it would, of course, add, add up together the longer you are there. And don't forget one thing, that uh, anything that we look at on the International Space Station that's still protected by the Earth's, uh, you know, um, electromagnetic sphere, right? It's electromagnetic uh, kind of protection, uh, the magnetosphere, and also the physical shielding by Earth also protects. But as soon as you go really deep space, and there are only very few astronauts who went deep space, you had to go to the, to the moon. Um, those are, uh, you know, it's just a handful of people. So anyway, so just to say this is connections, a synapse is a connection between two neurons like this, and we can measure this, right? That's the point. And we can also measure what happens when there are changes in this, that's called synaptic plasticity. Okay, that when you learn something, uh, then there is some synapse in your brain that changed its ability. The first neuron makes the second neuron fire, right? So that's the idea. 
And you can, we can also have techniques that I don't have time to, because this could be a course in itself, how we can actually read out the various parts of the brain in, a, in an experimental animal or in humans using various behavioral tests, like novel place recognition. For example, you know, if you would come in, let's say, tomorrow to this thing, to this room, and let's say this screen would be over there, you would notice it, right? So that, that, that's how your spatial memory works, right? In a room, you would know where things are relative to each other. So we can manipulate that. And we know that, for example, this structure called the hippocampus is responsible for spatial memory and so on. Okay, so I'm going to you know, take you through questions and just very, very quick answers. This was, the first question was, let's look at simplified modeling of GCR because we cannot actually take a mouse and ship it to Mars, right? That's not possible right now. So the best thing what you can do is that you take a mouse and then get some money from NASA, it's expensive. Then you have to take a linear accelerator, a bunch of physicists, and technicians and you put your little mouse in there and push the button and they tell you to get out because it's very expensive so so it's kind of that's how it works right so um so this was the initial measurement and i'm not going to explain this in detail but basically the first this little blip here is what they call an action potential in a presynaptic cell and this is the postsynaptic response this is in control mice where we put the mouse there but didn't push the button for no radiation and again, presynaptic cell fires. After half a gray, you see changes, right? That's the, that's the only thing you need to know. So, so indeed, right, we know that a single ion, this is proton, remember protons were the most frequent in, in deep space, it definitely changes things for weeks, right? I, I thought this was a pretty cool title for a paper, don't you think? Neurophysiology of space travel. Try to beat that, right? So, <laughs> We were very proud of that. So anyway, so protons alter synaptic signaling and memory as well. So our collaboration, collaborators me measured these objects. And then you move, move around objects, how mice can, can kind of see that. Um, if anybody's interested, I can tell you how it's done. And then in addition to protons, our collaborators looked at, oh, you know, silicon, all of those things, oxygen that I mentioned, they are frequent in space. And by the way, these, these things, as they zip around like little bullets, they are so frequent that the astronauts actually could see it, and the, the retina could like, boom, they would just see a little light flash, right? Every now and then, it's really spooky. And then they went, they also had like film up there when they went up to, to the moon, uh, and, and they developed the film, that film that was not exposed to light, right? And then they saw these like little scars on the film, right? So, so it's quite frequent. In fact, on a trip to Mars, every single nucleus in your body would be hit at least once by one of these energetic ions, right? So it's, it's a scary proposition. Okay, so, so this was just a single ion, and then <laughs> we put the mouse there for like whatever, a minute. They gave the dose, we got out. But it's low dose, right? So it's low dose, what you would expect to experience on a trip to Mars, right? But it was just one ion and we gave it immediately. So NASA said when, when they learned about all these results that, well, maybe it's, you know, it's bad because you gave the, all, the, all those in one go, right? So let's distribute the dose. Well, you know, that was the second step. And, but of course we can't take a linear accelerator for like a year and a half, <laughs> that's not possible. So they came up with this idea that they put a radiation source here, and these are cages, and each cage has a mouse or a rat, and they build this actual facility just for this, right? <laughs> so, so um, and then we got the mice, and uh, Peter was sitting there, did the experiments, and again, I'm not going to show you, the, the point is the ability of neurons to actually, you know, discharge action potentials and communicate with other cells, the ability of the synaptic plasticity, of the ability of one neuron to influence the other on a long-term basis, right? When you learn something for your exam, that's what some, some synapses facilitated. And your, um, your memory performance. So all of these, so it's, it's harmful. Chronic, low dose, or realistic doses of, um, of radiation is harmful. This was neutron. 
And uh, then Peter actually did another study where he compared the acute versus the chronic neutron radiation. And lo and behold, there wasn't much of much difference. The acute was about just as bad as, as having it distributed, which is interesting. Anyway, so this was, was number three, right? So first we used a single, single ion, but acutely, like, and then we used a single ion, but distributed, well, not ion, but neutron, distributed over time. Now let's do now more than one ion set now. So maybe then all of this will go away, right? All of this bad stuff. So basically, so we had, long story short, uh, a six ion mixed beam experiment, right? So it's still acute in the sense it's still given to the mouse fast, uh, but it's six different ions, right? What happens? Again, I'm not going to give you the details, but basically we change, there is a change in synaptic transmission. Again, so the ability of neurons to communicate is changed. You don't think this is much, but basically if you drink a little, you know, a little bit of uh, alcohol, right, is going to change your synaptic transmission. Or if you take a, a anesthetic drug or anything like this, right, in the hospital, they, these are all like changing the synaptic transmission 10, 20%, 30%, and so on. So, so it's actually, it's there. The mouse doesn't die, but it's there. How neurons actually work together, it's an oscillatory phenomenon. And um, that's also ch measurably changed. That was something that Gary was sitting there did. And again, memory disruption. So acutely delivered mixed ion, galactic uh, cosmic radiation, still is harmful. And then lastly, now I said, okay, well, let's do the magic experiment, right? That's as close as it gets to sending a mouse to Mars, right? So that is, let's not deliver it for a long time, over many days, uh, let's have mixed ions, right? So that's what they did. This is what they call the 33 ion, 33 beam experiment, where, you, where we had these seven um, uh, nuclei, basically, or radiation. And for example, for protons, they delivered the different energies, right? Because it's a mixture of energies that's, uh, that's out there. And as you can read, so it's two centigrade, so hundreds of a grade per day, six days a week for four weeks for a total of 24 irradiation days, right? So it's it's not quite as long as a Mars mission, but it's pretty impressive, right? So this was a very expensive ex experiment. So this is how it looks like. Actually, Peter got to go there to Brookhaven, the linear accelerator. And at the end of it, there are the mice, right, in cages. And this is how it looks like. This is like a fancy design to have these animals in these cages and then put at the end of that long linear accelerator. And what is the result? Well, this is the chronic 33 beam experiment. So mission relevant GCR exposure can disrupt neuronal properties and cognitive functions. So the cognition, the behavior was down. So it was not as good. Uh, we had molecular measures as well that I'm not talking about. Uh, but in general, more realistic modeling did not correlate with either better or worse outcomes. So it's roughly the same as just giving one type of ion acutely, right? So after all this, we went back to baseline. It's still not good for you to go to be on a trip to Mars, it's for sure, but it may not be prohibitive, you know? And it could also be that we heard about like how there are different individuals who differentially react to stressors. So it's possible that genetic background differences or what they eat or all of those things may actually rescue the situation. But anyway, so this is the, the take home message. So I just took you through it to illustrate that to really mimic CNS, so brain effects of galactic uh, radiation, Cosmic radiation is actually pretty tricky. It requires a lot of collaboration between physicists who actually can do this in the linear accelerator, technicians, and everybody else who were involved in this enormous effort. So, so that's where we are now. And uh, um, and again, I as always, I always thank the the taxpayers in this case, the NASA funding for letting us do these experiments. So, thank you.
Thank you. Um, how has NASA responded to this information? Like, are they taking any, are there any precautions that you can take? Can yes, I mean, now they said they are convinced with this, that there is an issue, but it's not lethal, right? So it's not like they're going to go, like they don't, won't die from this, right? So, but, so that was the conclusion of this. It's roughly a 10 year body of work, right? Of maybe a five, six labs. And there are some other labs that, that also got simultaneous funding. So NASA was very concerned about this. And so now, basically this descriptive study is essentially a description of you irradiate what happens, right? To these outcome measures. So that kind of is now.